In our previous video, we talked about some simple Lewis structures for compounds where all of our atoms obeyed the octet rule. That means that everybody except for hydrogen had eight valence electrons in their final bonded form. Hydrogen, remember, will only ever have two valence electrons, but we don't really consider this to be an exception to the octet rule. There are three major categories of exceptions that we'll talk about. The first is a sub-octet, where some atoms can be stable with fewer than eight electrons. The second is compounds with an odd number of electrons, where obviously somebody can't have eight. And then the last category is a super-octet or expanded octet, where a central atom can have 10, 12, sometimes even 14 electrons. So we'll start with the sub-octet. Boron is the most common element that exhibits this sub-octet um, behavior. And so boron starts off with three electrons. And in the end, it's happy with six in total. So if we were going to draw the Lewis structure for BH3, we would need to start off with boron in the center. We would surround that by our three hydrogens. And then we would put a single bond between each pair of atoms. Now if we count up the electrons that we've used, we have three bonds, which is a total of six electrons. If we count up how many electrons we have available, boron is in group 3A, so it starts off with three. We have three hydrogen atoms, and each of those has one valence electron. So we have six electrons in total. That means we're done. We don't have an extra pair of electrons to put a lone pair on our boron atom. And so the boron is just going to hang out with its six electrons. It is possible for BH3 to, as a compound, combine with a different compound where there is a lone pair and the lone pair becomes the shared pair in a bond, but we're not going to get into that too deep right now. The second major exception to the octet rule that we'll see is when there's the, the total number of available electrons is an odd number. This usually occurs when there's a nitrogen and some other elements. Um, sometimes if there's a charge, like if it's a polyatomic ion, that might skew the number of electrons available. Um, but even then, it's still mostly species that have nitrogen in them. So NO, nitrogen monoxide, if we were to write our Lewis structure for that, we're going to start off with a nitrogen and an oxygen. Um, if I were to draw the structure the way that I'm more comfortable doing, I would put a single bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen. And then I would go ahead and put my electrons around the atoms so that everybody was satisfied. Now, at this point, I would count up my electrons. Nitrogen starts with five valence electrons, and oxygen brings six. So that means I have a total of 11 electrons to distribute. The structure as I've drawn it here uses two, four, six on the nitrogen. Another two in that bond makes eight, and then the six on the oxygen make 14. 
So I need to get rid of three electrons. Just like in the previous video, I can take these two lone pairs that are next to each other and fold them into a double bond. That will mean that I have used 12 electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. But I only have 11. To get rid of that one electron, I can't force it, I can't put it into a bond. I can't add a like a triple bond there. That won't work. And so to get rid of one single electron, I'm just going to have to erase one electron. Um, so I might get rid of that one electron on the nitrogen. Nitrogen typically takes the odd number of electrons. Um, there's various reasons for that, but the simplest way to keep it in mind is that since, uh, since nitrogen comes to the party with an odd number of electrons, after the bonding is done, it's going to end up with the odd number of electrons. So my final structure for nitrogen monoxide is this, with a double bond and the one lone electron on the nitrogen. Now, we call that lone electron that's not part of a pair a free radical. You sometimes will see people talk about antioxidants and how they are good at getting rid of free radicals like in your body. Um, free radicals are incredibly reactive. So nitrogen monoxide is not really the most stable compound. The, the one electron by itself really wants to have a partner. And so if there's another free radical around, it will seek it out and pair up with it. Um, and if there's not another free radical, then it can actually steal an electron from a pair, creating a new free radical. And you get kind of this chain reaction. So things like antioxidants that, that scavenge the free radicals basically pair them off with someone else and stop that chain reaction. The last exception to the octet rule is called a super octet or an expanded octet. In certain atoms, not all nonmetals, but any nonmetals that are in the third period or below. So mostly we're talking about phosphorus and sulfur. You might see this happen with selenium. Um, Bromine might, but doesn't do this very often. Iodine is, is, it's possible to do, and xenon can sometimes form a superoctet. A superoctet really just means that you've got more than eight electrons on your central atom. The way that this forms is those d orbitals that start to exist in the third period. Some of those d orbitals can be sort of promoted, and they can be treated as though they were valence electrons, even though they're in the d orbital. And so by using those d orbitals that are now accessible, you can have an atom that has more than just the eight electrons. Some of the compounds with superoctets are fairly easy to see that they're going to have a superoctet. So like SF6, our fluorines are only going to make one bond, which means we have to have our sulfur in the center, and that sulfur has to be surrounded by six fluorine atoms. Now, if I were to count up all of my electrons, there'd be about a gazillion. Each fluorine is going to bring seven 
valence electrons. So that's 42 from our fluorines. And then our sulfur brings another six, which means we have a total of 48 electrons available. Each of our fluorines has one bond. And if we add three lone pairs to each fluorine, then each fluorine has eight total electrons. There's six fluorines, so that makes up our 48 electrons. And the sulfur is contented with its 12 electrons. There are other cases, um, like the xenon compounds that I mentioned before, and some of your polyatomic ions, where at first glance, it doesn't look like you've got a super octet, um, like xenon tetrafluoride, which is XEF4. When you first look at that, you'd think, okay, well, the xenon has four fluorines with single bonds. That's its eight electrons. But it turns out that there are some lone pairs on the xenon because of this superoctet behavior. Identifying those compounds is a little trickier, but we can fairly easily do it if we are thinking about formal charge. That is the next video, so stick around.